Oh, Jesus, we invite you this morning to, to move in power in our minds and our hearts that anything else that's on our mind, any other thoughts, any other concerns, Lord, you, by the power of your Spirit, would let them just fade away. Help us to focus on what you have for us this morning. You are the living bread. Lord, you are, you are the living water. And we invite you, Lord, to feed us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. Almost 14 years ago, I was subpoenaed to testify at the sentencing hearing of a, a man who had been found guilty of a very grievous offense. His defense attorney was one of our church members, and he had referred me to this man three to four months earlier asking for pastoral care. He had admitted that he was definitely guilty. And the district attorney was asking the court for three life sentences. I've always thought that was a curious request. This guy wasn't a cat. He only had one life, I think. But the DA cited the, the testimony of a court-appointed psychiatrist who felt the defendant had a 75% chance of reoffending once left, uh, once he was paroled. And I was asked to testify on behalf of the defense as a credible witness and a pastoral counselor for the defendant. I was questioned by the prosecuting attorney. I was questioned by the defense attorney. And to my surprise, I was questioned by the judge. This never happens on TV. We, we had that, at that, after we did all that, then we had to adjourn until two o'clock. This was a, a, not a jury trial. The judge would be passing sentence. And when we returned, the judge was prepared to pronounce sentence. The fellow was sentenced to 50 years in the state prison with all but 16 years remanded. In essence, the man would serve 16 years and then be par paroled. However, if he reoffended, he would, he would spend the rest of those 34 years plus any new years that the, the new offense had was put upon him. And the judge gave the primary reason for such a lenient sentence on my testimony. The prosecution was incredulous, and I was in shock. Even I thought the sentence was too lenient. And besides that, just a few years prior, I had been an over-the-road truck driver. Oddly enough, no one asked me for my credentials, but apparently assumed that an older man wearing a clerical collar must be someone to be trusted. You know, if you go to Amazon.com, you can buy a clerical collar and a shirt. But later on, as I reflected upon this, this event, I realized that it was remarkably similar to what Jesus had done for me upon the cross. For many of my sins, I had to pay immediate consequences. But once I bowed my will and my knee to the Savior, the slate was wiped clean. And I was welcome to come into the presence of God as a family member. Even I knew that my sentence did not reflect my true guilt before God. And I am literally eternally grateful. As it ends up, the old adage, it's not what you know, but who you know, is spot on. This morning, we're going to focus our, on our passage from Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 10. We're going to refocus on who we are in Christ and how it doesn't re reflect what we deserve but what, who we've come to know. Those who are in Christ Jesus have had an amazing shift in their position before God and find themselves seated with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're beginning the fourth week of our Lenten journey where we're focusing on the cross of Jesus Christ. The first week we looked at the importance of remembering our baptismal vows, which we will go through again and recommit to on Easter morning. We looked at the example of Noah, who chose to be obedient to God and build the ark, and how through his obedience, he and his family were saved from the waters of the flood. We saw that Jesus was a perfect example 
who though he was sinless, he submitted to the will of the Father by going through the baptismal waters. It was a sign of his obedience to what the Father had sent him to do. In the second week, we looked at the example of Abraham's obedience to the Lord's command to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Even though he was the son of promise, Abraham chose obedience because he trusted in the word and promise of the God that he had come to know, and he would obey him without question. God did not allow him to follow through with sacrificing his son, but as you know, provided a ram that was caught in the thicket. This was a foreshadowing of what God the Father was going to do through his son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. In obedience to the Father's will, he became a sacrifice for our sins. And because of that, we should follow him out of obedience. And last week, we considered Romans 7, where the Apostle Paul wrote that the law of God was holy, it was righteous, and it was good because it reflected the will and the character and the nature of God. Even though he knew this, Paul wrote that he was unable to perfectly keep the law because of his sin nature, which was still part of his human condition. And for all of his understanding and his love of the law, he could not keep it in his own strength. And he, he discovered that even though the law was holy, it had no power to save him but only to show him that without Jesus Christ, he had literally no hope. And today we're going to focus our journey with Jesus as he heads toward the cross. And there we're going to find the greatest example of love and mercy ever found anytime or anywhere in the history of man. In the first chapter of Ephesians, Paul explained that the greatest example of God's love and power was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In this morning's reading, he demonstrates how that same power can transform our lives from death to life. And Paul began the second chapter by reminding the Ephesian Christians of their hopeless condition before they encountered Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. He says, as you, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Paul wanted the Ephesian Christians to remember that before they encountered Jesus Christ, they were the walking dead. They were stumbling along, following the enemy of God, who would lead them to hopelessness and despair. And in eternity, outside of the presence of God. And that's a condition we cannot even imagine or comprehend the misery of no God. But even though they were physically alive, they were spiritually dead. In today's world, Hollywood has produced many TV shows and, and films about zombies, the walking dead. And amazingly enough, these shows and movies are very, very popular. The, the, these zombies are walking around in a state of decay and continually seek to find the living so they can bring them down to the dead as well. And Paul wanted his readers to see that life without, without Christ was a spiritual death with the result of becoming less and less of what God had created us to be as human beings. And one of the greatest lies that Satan has perpetuated upon the unbeliever is making them believe that they're doing just fine without God and are free to follow their own desires without consequence or, or any kind of conditions. And when confronted, they, you may have noticed, they rise in moral indignation and question the right of the confronter to judge their actions. Good and bad, right and wrong, are considered individual decisions. And the consideration of God's law or even the good of others is irrelevant. In our world today, we see the perfect example of Satan's corruption and evil being played out in those who support abortion and call it a reproductive right of women. 
and the proposal that taxpayers who should not only accept it but pay for it. They support the lucrative business of harvesting and selling baby parts instead of experiencing shame for the great evil. They have passed laws that now have threatened to expose their godlessness and are seeking to penalize and impose, impose huge financial penalties on those who have pointed out what they had done and how evil it was. We're seeing the walking dead moving around and talking, but we recognize the voice as coming from the very pits of hell. We see the same godlessness being forced upon the American people with the LGBTQ initiatives and the requirement that our children be taught the perversion of what God has created as something beautiful for a married husband and wife. But they want to open up to every venue and every co combination, no matter how perverse, no matter how ungodly. They want to not only do it, but celebrate it. And they want to, you to join them in that celebration. And the walking and talking dead are trying to make this a law. This is no longer a matter of difference, a difference agendas with political parties. But it's a war between the light of Christ and the darkness of Satan and his hate-filled loathing of anything that brings glory to God. The 17th century revivalist and theologian Jonathan Edwards described those who were without sin, who were without Christ, as though dead. The sinner never, nevertheless walks about actively in sin. He's dead towards God, but he, he's alive to all wickedness. Paul is reminding the reader that those who choose to follow this path were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And Paul shows that those who walk according to their own sinful desires and refuse to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord show themselves to not be God's children, but children of wrath. Let's look at our passage this morning from Ephesians 2, beginning at verse 4 and through 6. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised up with him, and seated, with us, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The first two words of this section are probably the most important, but God. These two words sum up the whole power and story of the gospel. They tell what God has done and how he has intervened in what is, would otherwise be a hopeless situation. Before God moved on our behalf, we were stuck in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And left in that condition, we were destined to be objects of, of God's holy judgment and wrath. It's vitally important that we describe who this God is according to the Holy Scriptures. Because there are many viewpoints of, of what the nature of God is, and some see him as a benevolent grandfather who just wants everyone to be happy and wants us to play well with one another and be kind. And some view him as really wanting to help us, but basically he, can't just, he just can't do much. Or he's just indifferent to what happens to us. If you ask a thousand people to, to tell you what they, how they perceive God, you may get a thousand different answers. It's a tendency of the unregenerate heart to fashion a God after their own imaginations. But that's not the God that Paul is writing about. He's the God of the Scriptures. He's the Father of, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He's the Creator and Sovereign over all creation. Nothing occurs without His permission. And there's not one random molecule in the universe outside of His control. We've been discussing this in our Behold Your, Behold Your God, Thy Weight of Majesty series. The God of Scripture is incomprehensible. He's all-knowing, all-powerful, not bound by time and space. He's infinite and eternal. 
And we can never comprehend this God in our own wisdom, but we desperately need his self-revelation uh, through his word. James Boyce, in discussing the truth that God is holy, wrote in his commentary on Ephesians, nothing is more important in Paul's opening description of God's great plan of salvation unfolding over the ages than that God is a moral God. He's not indifferent to issues of right and wrong, justice and injustice, righteousness and sin. On the contrary, it is because of his opposition to everything sinful that his great plan of salvation was devised and is being executed. Sin will be punished. Righteousness will be exalted in his universe. God's wrath against sin flows from his holiness. And that's why the human condition without Jesus Christ is frightening. This is God's universe. And he does not have a live or let live attitude toward those who oppose him. This is the God of whom Paul is writing. And this is the God that we need, even though once we didn't know it. Instead of running to him to find, to find new life and righteousness, we're prone to run away from him to wickedness and spiritual death. But God, what a wonderful statement. It was God who was, who was unwilling to leave us in that desperate and deplorable state that Paul describes here at the beginning of this chapter. We're unable to save ourselves because we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We're no more able to help ourselves than a corpse is in breathing new life into itself. We were enslaved to sin. And we were those who ran toward our own desires and were by nature children of wrath. But God, within these two words lies the, the beauty and the wonder of the Christian gospel. We were without hope. God intervened to save us through Jesus Christ, who dealt with all of our guilt and our shame that our sins brought upon us. Why would he do this for those who are so prone to reject him and his word? And Paul writes, it's because, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. God did what only he was able to do, and that is to set us free from death and sin. This, one, this is one of the most common themes in all the scriptures, in most every question or struggle that we have. It's Jesus Christ, it's God in Christ who intervenes. Paul is clear at, in our passage that God does all these things because he is merciful. And he loves completely in a way that we cannot fully understand. We love with condition. He loves unconditionally. He even loves us when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. I'm prone to try to figure out the motivation behind someone's love and favor. I'm trying to figure out a reason for it. But with God, it's because that's who he is. And C.S. Lewis has captures this perfectly in his book, The Four Loves. He says, God who needs nothing loves into existence holy superfluous creatures in order that he may love and perfect them. He creates the universe already foreseeing this buzzing cloud of flies around the cross, the flayed back pressed up against the, the uneven stake, the nails driven through the mesial nerves. If I may dare the biological image, God is a host who deliberately creates his own parasite sites and it causes us to be that we may exploit and take advantage of him herein is love this is the diagram of love itself the inventor of all loves paul asserts that god's grace his undeserved favor is the reason that we can be saved we don't deserve it and there's nothing we could possibly do to earn it, to earn our way into his kingdom. There's nothing we could do to walk up to the gates of heaven and say, hello, I'm Mike Moffat, I'd like to come in. 
It's not a matter of who I am. It's a matter of who I know. In the next verse, he shows how much God loves us and how far he's willing to go with his blessings. Ephesians 2, 6, and he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we too are raised up and seated with Jesus. There are three events referred to here that actually happened to Jesus. His resurrection, his ascension, his enthronement at the right hand of God, the Father. And Paul assumed a union between Christ and those for whom he died, those who have come to trust him. So that it is said that the, that the Redeemer, what can be said of the Redeemer is also said of the redeemed. What once historically actually happened to Jesus also happened to those who come to him by faith. But it's happened to them in a mystical and spiritual way. There will come a day that it will happen in a physical way at the resurrection. But now for now, the, the believer experiences this reality in an inward way and in a newness of mind and heart. You cannot know Jesus Christ without it changing you. And a good way to understand the implications is to consider Jesus' teaching on the, the connectedness of the vine and the branches. They're part of one another. And when we are seated beside Jesus, we're also seated behind, beside the one who's seated next to him, which is the Father. And Jesus uses this imagery with the vine and the branches in John chapter 15. Being attached to the vine, the branches benefit from all that the vine offers. And we see in Jesus' high priestly prayer of John 17, for those who would believe. He says, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Paul is teaching that we are positionally seated with Jesus at the right hand of the Father, not in the future, but right now. It resembles the scene at the Last Supper where Jesus says that one of the disciples is going to betray him. Listen to John 13, 25 and 26. So that the disciple, John, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, It's he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. And so when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Because of John's position of intimacy, leaning back against Jesus, he receives the revelation of who is going to betray Jesus. Because we are in Christ and spiritually seated with Christ, who is seated next to the Father, we have an opportunity to be in a place of intimacy with Jesus, and we have access to the Father because of it. It's no wonder that we can come before the throne of grace with confidence if we know Jesus, because we're coming in Jesus' name, the very name that has the most merit before the Father. I'm afraid that often we don't understand our position in Christ as those who've been made alive, as those who have been raised up. And we miss the relationship and the power that is ours through him. The next few verses give us a clear understanding of how important it is that we live into who we are in Christ. Let's read verses 7 to 10. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The place that God has brought us in Jesus Christ is a place of intimacy and revelation. It's where God opens up his heart to us. And that's where we are now. 
Now God is speaking to us intimately through his word and through his spirit. This is how he has chosen to show us his greatest kindness, both now and in the coming age. And Paul makes it abundantly clear that all of this has come about because of God's amazing grace and mercy. It wasn't, wasn't because of something we did, lest we become boastful, but it's totally by grace. And we are to reveal his handiwork to those who have yet to know or understand who God is. We've been created in Christ Jesus to continue the work that Jesus began while he was here on earth. Everything we need is at our disposal. God's power, God's authority, his strength, his love, his wisdom, his compassion, and his mercy, they're all ours. Why? Because we have become family and have all the blessings and tools that the kingdom has for us. It's all at our disposal. When we focus on the fact of our position, it should certainly change the way we pray and the way we live. Wouldn't you think so? The positive lesson that Jesus was teaching the disciples in our, go our gospel reading this morning from John 6, 1 to 15, is that there are things that only God can do like making five barley loaves and two fish. It says 5,000 men, but that's not including the women and children. He took five loaves of fish and two, uh, five loaves of uh, barley and two fish, and he fed maybe 12 to 15,000 people. But the real kicker is he took up more than he began with. Only Jesus could have done it. But I wonder, if we're walking in faith with him, is the answer to hunger loaves and fishes that we pray and bless that God may feed the masses? I wonder. We're to reveal his handiwork. He makes the point that by taking up more than he began with, that it was Jesus who was commanding this. It was not something we would have even thought of to try. He continually showed his power and his authority. And after Pentecost, they finally got the point. They were to reveal the power and the authority of Jesus in their everyday lives because in the Holy Spirit, they were in this intimate position by being seated with him in the heavenly places and therefore had full access to everything of the kingdom of God, including now the Spirit of God who flowed through them and lived within them. Now they're supposed to be the one who bear the light. It's the greatest privilege that Paul had in mind when he wrote this section of Ephesians. And I want to close with a few questions to ponder. Have you been made alive in Christ? Or does this seem like foolishness to you? Do you sense the power of Christ within you? Do you have a sense that you are seated with Christ in the heavenly realm? This week I have homework for you. I want to encourage you. That I'm hoping you daily have times of prayer and devotion, but I'm encouraging you every day when you do your devotions that you sit next to Jesus, that you sit quietly next to him in the presence of the Father. And you ask him to speak to you, revealing his love, making this a part of your daily devotion and times of worship. If you're sitting right next to him, he can hear you. Know this, that's where you are. If you are in Christ, you're sitting right next to the Lord. Christianity, Christianity is not a mere doctrine or the hope that somehow God will forgive your sins. Christianity is Christ alive in his people. And Paul writes in Colossians 1.27, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles, the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope and glory. If we are enjoying intimacy with God, we will no longer set our affections on the world, but on God's glory. 
Because to do anything other than that, the, the scriptures describe this as a dog returning to its vomit. To know Jesus Christ and to return to the world is just that sick. If we pursue him continually, we'll be rewarded by his love and the power to stand and fight in Jesus' name. It's exactly what has to happen. It's the only hope we have as a nation. It's the only hope we have as a world that God's people know who they are and know their position before him. Let's pray. Lord God, we are overwhelmed by the intimacy that you invite us to in Christ Jesus. And Lord, I, I, I repent of those times and I forget that, those times that I'm trying to do things in my own strength and then wonder why it's not happening. Lord, teach us this week, Lord, speak to us, teach us individually what it is and what it affords us to be sitting right next to you, seated in the heavenly places in Christ. Lord, I'm praying that you'll let us come alive in a new way, that you will move in power in and through us, and that we will radiate the love and compassion of Christ to those around us. For it's in his holy name that we pray. Amen.